Uh, we are not in a national crisis. We are not in a regional crisis. We were and are in a crisis that knows of zero borders. It's going to hit you and me and anybody else for that matter. So it, it requires uh, global responses that can be universal. Hello and welcome to G-Zero World. I'm Ian Bremmer, and today I'll sit down with head of the European Central Bank, Christine Lagarde. We'll talk about the pandemic and why Europe's economic response has been among the biggest international success stories that we've seen in years, so far at least. You've heard of the room where it happened. This is the Zoom where it happened. As coronavirus swept across the globe, European Central Bank President Christine Lagarde was on a video conference call asking for something unprecedented. To Lagarde, it was clear even back in March when she made her case to Eurozone finance ministers that Europe, and indeed the world, was on the precipice of something big. Coronavirus would soon wreak havoc on health systems and economies alike, irrespective of borders or politics. European leadership would have to decisively act and in collaboration as hospital beds filled, businesses stymied, and supply chains were disrupted. A massive global recession was underway. During that conference call, Lagarde asked the ministers to consider a one-off creation of something completely new. They were called Corona Bonds, or a collective debt issued from the European Investment Bank in order to blunt the pandemic's economic fallout not as individual European nations, but as a unified Europe. And in doing so, Lagarde set in motion a groundbreaking rescue plan. Championed by those like German Chancellor Angela Merkel and French President Emmanuel Macron, it would include selling collective European debt as a means to help Europe's poorer countries. Member nations agreed on a massive pooling of resources and a breaking of one of the European Union's oldest taboos mutualized debt across the continent, and a hell of a send-off for Germany's departing Chancellor Merkel. Today, the impacts of that rescue are playing out as Europeans head back to work and school, despite more than 216,000 dead from the virus so far. Europe's death toll is now only slightly higher than the United States, despite massive population differences, and they tend to be older and therefore more vulnerable. But this isn't over yet. Countries like Italy, France, Spain, and Germany are now reporting climbing cases. The UK too, but they're not a part of the European Union anymore. The World Health Organization has warned that the resurgence constitutes a very serious situation. Masks and social distancing are the orders of the day. And there's real hesitation to return to lockdowns. The reasons being, not least of which, the cost. Christine Lagarde, president of the European Central Bank, so good to be with you again. So good too, Jan. Christine, so many things to talk about on the global agenda right now, but perhaps the most interesting way to get into this is that this massive crisis, uh, in many ways the biggest of our lifetimes, uh, the Europeans seem to be trying to make more of an opportunity from the crisis than others. You have a pretty unique seat on that. Tell me a little bit about what that means to you. Well, as you said, Jan, the, the crisis uh, is, is phenomenal, is monumental. It's unlike anything else that we've seen before. And uh, as the saying goes, never waste a good crisis. And in very surprising ways, I think the Europeans have actually uh, applied that to the letter. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. If you look at the way in which Europe was always criticized and was always uh, regarded as this uh, unfinished business that could not possibly um, organize itself, well, in the face of the crisis, uh, all members of the European Union, 27 different member states, decided finally to jointly borrow on the markets in order to help those member states that were most severely, severely hit by the crisis. And to help not in the form of cheap loans, if you will, but in the form of pure grants, which is something that was just not expected and that had been fiercely debated and objected against. So this crisis was a catalyst 
uh, to a move that, that is really a signal of solidarity, of understanding where it hurts and how we can all collect ourselves from this crisis in a better shape than when we entered into the crisis. So that's, that's an example of, uh, you know, how things can actually materially change uh, despite uh, the uh, unbelievable crisis that uh, we've all gone through. I mean, I think arguably this is the biggest success of international governance and cooperation that we have seen since the pandemic has started. And, you know, you make the point that this, is, this was not something that you would have seen from the Europeans historically. If I think about 2008 and the financial crisis, if I think about the Greek crisis, the Eurozone crisis, a couple of years later, the response was very different. It did not bring Europe together. Why so different this time? Um, I'm tempted to say uh, because of COVID-19. Because of COVID-19, because the, the triggering factor for the crisis was not the banks, was not finance, was not um, the bursting of a huge uh, stock market bubbles. Uh, it was not the, um, um, the, the bad behavior of some policymakers somewhere uh, in the region. It was actually this teeny tiny little virus that went around from one country to the other in, in almost instant time. So the fact that everybody was in the same boat, uh, that it was going to hit without distinct, distinction of, you know, with, behind which border you were, uh, what your wealth was, I think created a sense of uh, anxiety, uh, vulnerability, um, the fear of the unknown, and the fact that at, at a, a, a narrow, small level, the defense would probably not be strong enough. So I think it, it, it really revealed to many of the Europeans the fact that all together and by operating together, we would be stronger against this teeny tiny little thing that was killing and, and creating so much havoc. I mean, we saw, of course, a little bit of those fights still under the hood with the Dutch saying, well, wait a second, you know, we can't send all of this money uh, to these poor countries that are gonna waste it. Uh, the, the Hungarians, um, you know, with a very different governance model um, that, uh, that might require conditionality in the loans. The success in getting that relief passed, has that resolved in any way some of these underlying problems? Has it created more progress structurally in allowing Europe to come together, in your view? You know, it, in, in any journey, it is the first step that is the hardest. So let's hope that this is the case as well. You are completely right, Jan. Those um, sort of uh, cultural trends, those substracts uh, that underline all this unbelievable governance that the European Union has been, they remain. Um, and the, uh, the characteristics of countries, the political preferences, all of that is in place. But I think there was something that was just broader, bigger, and more terrifying than all of that, which eventually brought all those at the table uh, on the same agenda. Is it going to survive? Is it going to be structurally uh, decisive for the construction of European Union going forward? We don't know yet. But at least it showed the world and it showed the Europeans themselves that they were capable in the face of that adversity to come together and to care for the weakest and to focus on where it would help most. And for the first time actually also in a while, the central banks were not the only game in town. And it was on those occasions that we could see that governments and central banks could actually work together and get a, a you know, bigger bang for their buck. Is that a big difference with what you see in the UK, in the United States, in other countries? Are, are the central banks the only game in town in responding in many of those countries? I, no, I wouldn't say that. I would say that this pandemic crisis that eventually created this economic havoc uh, brought all policymakers to the table and uh, 
around the world, we saw uh, fiscal measures being taken, massive efforts in order to sustain uh, credit, in order to make sure that money flew in the economy, in order to make sure that people either, either kept their jobs or kept their income if the jobs were suspended for a period of time. So I think the efforts was across the board and in, in many corners. Now, there are places where it took longer, uh, they were, it took different forms as well. Uh, the most fiscally capable countries put probably more on the table than others, but I think it was, it was a, a, a pretty general effort. Are you worrying that the sustainability of those efforts has a sell-by date? Yeah, very much so. I'd like to say that the recovery is underway, but that it is uncertain, incomplete, and uneven. And the uncertainty around the recovery has to do predominantly with COVID-19. Is it going to go into a small, a medium, a large, an oversized second wave? Will there be a third wave? How long will it take to find the right, very efficient testing methods? How long will it take to get the vaccine to market production uh, at, at, at a fast pace? What kind of therapy will be available? That's a bucket of uncertainties that is out there. But as part of the uncertainties, you also have those safety nets that have been put in place to support uh, jobs and employees, to support credit and companies, to support debt and sovereigns. Is that going to disappear suddenly? Will there be a gradual phasing out? Is the phasing out going to be synchronized with the pickup of the economy? Those are the big sort of more economic questions and financial questions uh, that uh, impair this recovery at the moment. So they are health and safety in the first place, but they're also economic and finance. And the courage that was deployed um, in the early days need to now be uh, really uh, very carefully applied to phasing out while recovery picks up. And this very uh, subtle synchron synchronization that is needed uh, will be the trigger to either success or very slow-going recovery. When, when you think about the European response, uh, you know, it's everyone, of course, is saying, well, Merkel is such a strong leader and she's managed to rebuild her legacy and Macron is right now much more popular than he was a year ago. But you also have Lagarde, you have von der Leyen, you have European superstructure, which is a really big piece of this. How much does it matter um, given that superstructure, uh, who Merkel's successor is going to be to the success of, of this European project? How much does it matter, the individual governments and governance, to ensure that the momentum is continued? You know, I think one of, one of the reasons uh, the, um, the crisis management has rapidly proved uh, effective and efficient had to do with the, uh, the cooperation uh, the no-nonsense approach that many of us, both in the superstructure, as you call it, you know, whether it was Ursula von der Leyen uh, or, or, or myself, uh, or uh, Angela Merkel and 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 uh, and Macron, you know, the way in which we approached this together, I think, played a great role in in being sort of fast to market and concerned about efficiency and implementation. But I think it's, it, it's the combination of the two. To have strong political leaders matter a lot, to have reliable, solid, and well-driven uh, institutions and a good governance in place matter a lot as well. The fact that uh, we were able to pick up the phone, uh, send texts to each other, uh, rally around a quick uh, telephone conference or Webex, just three or four of us, uh, actually was, was critically important. I had many of those um, quick uh, discussions to the point, as I said, no-nonsense discussions with Ursula, uh, with Charles Michel as well, who is president of the European Council. That's at the European level and obviously conversations with political leaders as well. So knowing each other well, connecting well, not being especially picky about who is going to get the credit at the end of the day, but being focused on the outcome and, and the result of what we were doing 
uh, I think, has, has mattered enormously. Clearly, the, the initial economic and monetary response in Europe has been strong. But as you say, we're in early innings here. Uh, are we right now through the worst part of the economic challenges? Or do you think next year, when a lot of these companies continue to need state support to continue to exist, when a lot of these citizens continue to need support because their furloughed jobs are gone for good. Do you think it gets worse before it gets better, I guess I'm asking economically? Yeah, and it's difficult to say. It's, all I know is that it's going to be a journey, and, and uh, you know probably a long journey, because coupled with that, you also have uh, factors that, have, that were there before the crisis, but that have accelerated and will transform our societies. Uh, when you look at the, the, the digitalization of uh, our economy and how so many things have been completely transformed because of the pandemic. I look just at, you know, payments at, at our modest level. Payment systems are currently going through massive transformation. Digital currencies that were this sort of somehow uh, exotic, interesting object of uh, research is clearly now at the forefront of uh, many of central bank governors' radar screens. So if you couple the, the, the necessary transitioning that will happen in the months to come, plus the transformation of our economy, plus the political determination to address climate change as a major risk, which will also impact the way in which we transport ourselves, the way in which we heat our houses, the way in which we, uh, we eat. Uh, uh, this, this is a massive transformation. Does this crisis set us back in terms of global governance and the ability to respond to crises from what you're seeing so far, not Europe, globally, or, or is it really creating mom momentum uh, for better response? I would hope that it triggers momentum. I can tell you that from this region of the world, uh, it has certainly encouraged, supported a, a much more um, collective and better, better governed collective response. I irrespective of, you know, um, noise on the line, if you will. And there will be. It's, it's inevitable. At a global level, I would hope that uh, international organizations that we have listened to, like the World Health Organization, uh, my, my, my favorite former institution, uh, the IMF, will come out of that uh, hopefully stronger than w they were when they went into the crisis. But uh, jury is out. We will see. What needs to change that you think is plausible that will make us feel more optimistic that the global trajectory has improved? Confidence is going to be key. Confidence in the economy, confidence no, con in your leaders, your institutions? You know, confidence in the, in the institutions, confidence in the governance that we choose for ourselves. And if those governances uh, need to be improved and need to be changed, then it's going to be for political leaders representing their constituents to actually address that issue. But it's, you know, if anything, this crisis has proven that uh, we are not in a national crisis. We are not in a regional crisis. We were and are in a crisis that knows of zero border, knows of zero differences in, in the color of your skin or in your sexual preference. It's going to hit you and me and anybody else for that matter. So it, it requires uh, global responses that can be universal. Christine Lagarde, thank you so much. See you soon. That's our show this week. Come back next week. And if you like what you see, and of course you do, because that's why we have this intimate personal relationship. We continue to grow every single week. Take a minute to sign up for G-Zero's excellent morning newsletter. It's called Signal.